Wavelength. You know, Adelaide has worked really hard over the last few years to build a small bar reputation. When I was a kid, the big night in Adelaide was kind of, you know, staying at home and watching the bill. Sparking the combos about Adelaide. As a female Sparky, I did get lots of comments on my gender. You should be having... I'm here to make a difference. Yeah, make the difference. Give the youth a voice. On Fresh 92.7. Hello and welcome to Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. Tonight I am joined by one of our long-term Wavo team members and a legendary freshie. Arsh, how are you tonight, man? I'm doing, I'm pretty good and I love being called legendary. That's, <laughs> that's just made my day. You are a legend around here, though. Oh, touches my heart. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, anyway, to tonight's show, this week on Wavelength, we'll be discussing whether the mandatory sentences for convicted sex offenders is too long. With a number of high-profile sex offenders getting off pretty easy in the last few years, we'll question whether their legal loopholes are more like hula hoops. We'll also be letting you know everything you need to know about the coronavirus, but next, Andrew will be exploring whether or not you should be withdrawing your super right now. Wavelength. So you've probably heard that you can dive into your super at the moment. It's a scheme allowed by the federal government to help support those of us struggling during this recession, and it allows many of us to withdraw thousands if eligible. But our super is meant to be there for our retirement and withdrawing it now could mean missing out on a tonne of more later down the line. This week, Andrew spoke to an expert at BDO to ask whether withdrawing your super now is the right thing to be doing. Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. The government's early access super scheme made headlines for all the wrong reasons back in July when the ATO website crashed after thousands of people attempted to withdraw their hard-earned early. The measure is part of the government's coronavirus financial response. However, there's some concern that despite the immediate benefit, it could leave people more than a bit cash-strapped in retirement. To find out a bit more on the issue, I had a chat with Lachlan Kennett, the Director of Private Wealth at BDO, who provide accountancy tax and other advisory services. He says there's good reason for allowing people to access their super early. Essentially, there's a lot of people out of work at the moment, either out of work or on reduced wages. And Australia's uh, superannuation scheme by international standards is, is really quite strong. Earlier this year, there was about $2.7 trillion in people's superannuation around the country. And so they've allowed access to superannuation to let people catch up on their bills, provide an emergency fund, and really to supplement the other government benefits. Obviously, last financial year, people were able to take $10,000 out. And this financial year, it's another $10,000. they have recently pushed back the deadline for that. It was September. they pushed it back now to 31 December. And obviously, still still the same requirement as last financial year. Although it may be beneficial, as you say, for people in the short term, is it wise for them to be able to withdraw this money early? And what sort of effects could that have down the line? Well, given the compounding effect of investments in general, for someone who's relatively young, say in their late 20s, early 30s, taking a $10,000 lump sum out of super can have a, a big impact on their retirement. The government provides a, a calculator specifically around COVID access to super, and that calculates out to, in today's dollars after accounting for inflation, twenty dollars to $30,000 less at retirement, but you can make a strong argument to say that realistically thirty to forty thousand dollars less in your hand is a more appropriate calculation. So it can have a massive impact on your long term savings. But obviously when people are up against real tight budget constraints, then it, it does make sense to access that money for support. I think the concern around it is that some people are accessing it for more discretionary style of spending. So some reports have indicated that thousands of young people may actually end up clearing out their savings totally. Is that a major problem, do you think? Definitely in the long term. And separation is only one component of it. Obviously impacting your retirement savings, but at a personal level, it will impact home affordability. There'll be people who are using their home deposit they've saved up purely just to get by. There'll be plenty of people who are finding it hard to, to pay mortgage, that sort of thing. And what we're seeing, both in Australia and around the world, is that younger people are actually worse affected as a result of this. They tend to be cheaper to make redundant, less experienced, and it can have a long-term impact on their career. And then potentially yeah, having to use their savings to fund, fund life they're living is another kick. Lachlan says there are alternatives like Job Seeker and Keeper if you're in need of financial support. However, accessing super early needs to be done wisely. We also discussed the tax office potentially going after those incorrectly claiming the benefit. Look, I would expect there would be some people caught. To put in perspective, superannuation generally does allow for financial hardship claims that people get a small lump sum out in, in case of financial hardship. But the normal process for that is that the, the individual has to be on has been on Centrelink for six months. They have to prove that they're behind their bills and, and can't fund their cost of living. And then that final sign-off and acceptance is normally done by the super fund, which they are ultimately responsible for. Now, with the COVID relief, the responsibility in determining whether you're eligible falls back on the 
individual. It's the individual's declaration. And the ATO does have a lot of information these days regarding your earnings and, and, and it's, it's in most cases live feed through from your employer. So I would imagine there will be a certain amount of leniency, but I, I would expect there to be some orders and, and some people to get caught out. So is there anything else you'd like to add at all? It's really important. Although access to superannuation is great at getting funds flowing through the economy and, and helping people out in dire circumstances, it is really important that people contact their super fund, have a quick chat to them, make sure for a lot of people there's insurance within superannuation and that may be the only insurance people have in regards to income protection and life cover and that can be affected if you withdraw a portion of your super. Go on to the government's website, Money Smart, and get some information about what's relevant and what's not for you. Well, there you have it. If you're going to withdraw your super early, make sure it's the right move for you. Lachlan wrapped up by saying that it's worth contacting your bank or utility providers to see what they can do to help you out. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. That there was Andrew speaking to Lachlan from BDO about whether you should be withdrawing funds from your superannuation right now. And Lachlan did mention in there if you are looking to prop yourself up or looking at withdrawing your super, head to moneysmart.gov.au. They'll be able to help you out a bit. Yeah, he makes a very good point about being very cautious about withdrawing super early because it can really impact you later on in life. Mm-hmm. Um, it kind of reminds me of, uh, it's, it's sort of like a parable. So someone on a low income who, say, works in a factory, right, can only afford $20 pairs of boots for, for work. Mm-hmm. Now, the boots are low quality, and so after a couple of months, several months, they'll eventually wear out and break. Yeah. Uh, whereas someone on a high income can afford good quality boots, say, $150, where they last for you for 10 years. Yeah. So over the long-term period, because you are paying for boots on a monthly basis, you actually further enrich yourself into debt. Yeah. Whereas someone who's on a higher income is sort of protected from that. Yeah, it's definitely that sort of cycle of just spending and not having enough. And, I mean, the the thing about superannuation, I find it's... I've always been... I've always knew it was there for my retirement and I probably wouldn't want to dip into it. I'm not in a position where I have to, thankfully, but um, I can imagine that it's really tempting to, especially if you have no other source of income and the government's saying you're allowed to. Especially as well because you have to, to to, to receive government benefits, you have to be into poverty, Mm. which by then it's almost too late. Yeah. Especially for people who aren't, like, we're, we're fairly young, I don't own my own house, I, my, my expenses are fairly low, whereas someone who's got a family, got a mortgage, that kind of, you know, debt and obligation, debt can really spiral very quickly. Yeah, I was watching this um, segment, I think it was like on the ABC or something, but it was this lady who withdrew, withdrew her super to get um, cosmetic procedures done. And I was like, I really don't think that's like the spirit of what they were doing this for. That's but- also <laughs> very true. You've got to be, you can't go out and buy like a new car or a tele- TV. <laughs> it's, it's meant for essentials. It's yeah, I think, I think. Food on the table. Absolutely. And like if you do need to withdraw this, and I mean, it's obviously very helpful if um, you are in a time position, then I would definitely recommend checking out Money Smart or talking to people who can help you out, give you, give you some advice about whether it's the right thing for you. Anyway, um, thank you for that, Andrew. But coming up after the break, we'll be getting into our lead story. Wavelength. So, Arj, tonight you've got a pretty interesting two-parter story for us. What's it all about and why do you want to explore this issue? Uh, So the story that I've done for tonight's show is about the sentencing laws, especially regarding serious crimes such as those of sexual offence. The reason why I decided to tackle this particular story was a the recent Barami case where a man sexually assaulted a very, very young girl. Yeah. And he can be out in as little as two years with time served. Yeah. Now, I thought that was appalling mm. for a number of reasons. And the main one is the impact on the victim mm. and what that means to other survivors of sexual assault. Why would you go through the trauma of going to the police rehashing your story, reliving all that trauma and then going to the court and doing that again if your attacker is going to get going to be out in two years. Absolutely. And there's certainly a lot to jump into right now and there's clearly a lot of problems there. So here's Arj talking to Peter Melanowskis, the leader of the opposition here in SA, about the penalties for sexual offences and asking whether they need to be harsher. And a quick heads up, this story does discuss sexual assault and sexual violence. So if any of that causes any problems for you, please turn turn down the radio now and we'll be back later with the music. Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. A 10-year-old girl in a Blarathel toilet block in a playground was tied up and raped multiple times. 
Her attacker, Hamez Barami, a 33-year-old who committed this atrocity in front of his own children, was given a 40% reduction on his jail sentence for pleading guilty so early and will serve a maximum of four years in prison. But he could be out in as little as two years with time served. I spoke to state Labor leader Peter Malinowskis about the reforms we need in our sentencing laws. What Barami did to this young innocent victim is beyond comprehension when you read the judgment. And it astounded me that a sentence as light as this one could be given, particularly considering from recollection the judge had reservations around the possibility of Mr Barami reoffending. It seems preposterous that someone could get out so quickly having done what Barami did. And so what we uh, introduced was a piece of legislation in the parliament aimed at changing that sentencing discount regime because Barami received a 40% discount for pleading guilty early. And and so we put a bill into the parliament that followed the Liberal government's own recommendation. But I was really disappointed when they decided to not pass that bill. If your amendments were to pass, would that diminish the possibility of people pleading guilty? Well, there would still be a sentencing discount in place for pleading guilty early. What we were seeking to do was change the very substantial discount of 40% for crimes of such a serious nature. And there was an independent review into this uh, sentencing discount regime. Uh, that was a review that was initiated by the Marshall Liberal government. They received recommendations from that review and then they sat on those recommendations and, and did nothing. And then we saw the injustice that we've seen with Barami. So that's why I put in place a bill to get through the parliament to do it. And, and we decided to adopt the government's own recommendations to maximise the opportunity of Marshall Liberal government supporting it. And the fact that they haven't is incredibly disappointing and I think shocks South Australians. So then why has the Liberal government tabled a similar bill for September? Politics. Entirely politics, Arge. I mean, I think... I think the truth is that we introduced this bill. It caught um, Stephen Marshall on the on the hop, the fact that they hadn't done it themselves. So rather than just supporting our bill through the parliament and getting it passed, which could have happened within a day or two, rather than just getting on with it, they decided to uh, vote for an adjournment, kick it down the road, and then introduce their own bill so they can claim it for themselves. Now, I, I think that's the sort of politics that just drives people crazy. Under our current laws... There is an appeals process for sentencing on both the prosecution and the defendant's side. Yes, yes. Are those adequate for challenging sentences that people deem are inadequate? I think there should be an appeals process. The DPP, as I understand it, is appealing that sentence in regards to the Barami matter, and I personally wish the DPP every success in that regard. There obviously needs to be an appeals process that's part of our judicial system. What my job is, and what the Parliament's job is, is to put the laws in place that provide comfort to the community, protect our, our kids from these predators, but also provides guidance to the court around how severely we expect these perpetrators to be treated in the event they're convicted. As we've seen in the past, previous offenders such as John Tipping or the people who assaulted Ulysses Dixon, Jill Ma, these people have all been released on parole or on bail. Mm. Do we think that we should introduce mandatory jail terms for offences such as these so well, that even in the instances where they do plead guilty and receive a sentence reduction, there is a minimum amount of time that they would spend in jail? What I believe is is that these people, they shouldn't be able to get out for as long as there is a serious prospect of them reoffending. We've already moved other legislative changes since I've been the leader of the Labor Party that are orientated towards not letting repeat sex offenders out if the court forms a view that there is a reasonable prospect of reoffending. I mean, it, we've got an obligation here to keep our community safe. All right, thank you very much for joining me. Is there anything else that you would like to add on this particular story? Look, I think, Arj, you know, um, when it comes to criminal sentencing, it's difficult and the Parliament's job is, is often complex, um, but it's important that we get it right. And when I got elected to Parliament, um, I was determined to sort of operate in a constructive way um, be a constructive leader, and that means I want to work with those across the aisle. I'm not so interested in scoring a point against the Marshall Liberal government as much as I'm in trying to get the right thing to happen here in the interest of community. And as a father of young kids myself, um, and as every parent out there, I think, would hope and expect, it's important that the Parliament just gets on with the job, and that's what I'm striving to achieve. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. That there was Arj talking to Peter Melanowskis about a new bill that's been introduced into Parliament and why that came about. Um, great chat there, Arj. I really enjoyed it. Is there anything in particular that stood out to you in your chat with Peter? The thing that stood out to me the most was the fact that Peter's bill died on the floor and the only reason was 
was so that the Libs could have the naming and the bragging rights of introducing a new sentencing bill. Okay. And I found that abhorrent that the the Libs would delay this much needed change in mm-hmm. our sentencing laws. Um, I, I think it's it's political point scoring at its worst, to yeah. be honest. Is there any is there anything in the chat that you didn't get to air? Anything that really stood out to you about the bill itself? Um, the bill itself was fairly simple. So it would see sentence reduced from sentence reductions reduced from forty percent to twenty five percent. I think that's a good change because we do need to incentivize people to plead guilty. Otherwise, no one would ever plead guilty. Yeah. Um, however, yeah, that, that's basically it. I, I really see no reason why this bill didn't pass through. I mean, you say it's a good change, but is it just a good start? Like, is there more that they should, that they should be doing? Is it harsh enough? Like, There definitely needs to be more that needs to be done. I feel like there should be mandatory minimums for sexual offences just mm-hmm. on the blanket so that even when there are reductions given, it means that the offender at least spends 10 to 15 years in jail. Yeah. Because in the Barami case, this girl was 10 years old. So that means, say her offender spends 10 years in jail, she'll be 20 when he's out. Yep. And that is still unbelievably young to have to know that your attacker is back on the streets. Yeah. Well, we've got more about this uh, two-part story from you coming up later, Arsh. But if this story has raised any trauma or problems for you, please know there is help out there. Just dial 1-800-RESPECT. They provide confidential sexual assault and family and domestic violence counselling via the phone and web chat. They're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. After the break, we'll be letting you know what the hell is going on with politics. <laughs> going on in politics at the moment. Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. It's been another big week, so let's jump right in. Google has launched an international campaign against the AECCC this week, urging its army of YouTubers to swamp the competition watchdog with complaints over its proposed news code. The new regulation would require Google Pay for news content that appears in any of their search results. The search giant has claimed content creators will be negatively impacted and has addressed an open letter to the Australian public urging them to protest the change. Meanwhile, frontbencher Joel Fitzgibbon revealed in a podcast this week that he believes the Labor Party may split in two due to ongoing internal division. He pointed to the party's inability to appeal to both metro and regional voters as the primary cause of a potential future breakdown. Fitzgibbon's colleague, Tanya Plibersek, has lashed out at him over the comments made. Also in the news, a home affairs mishap has resulted in the identity of a whistleblower being revealed, which is considered a criminal offence under federal law. The error occurred after an email was sent to the wrong recipient, after which the Commonwealth Ombudsman's office was alerted to the breach. The agency is now under review over the incident, and those responsible could be looking at a maximum penalty of six months imprisonment. Finally, the PM has delayed the release of a survey that showed only 31% of the public trusted the government before the COVID crisis, and our super contributions are expected to rise to 10% as early as next year. And that's what the hell's been going on in politics this week. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. Thank you for that, Hamish. Stay tuned for part two of Arja's story on whether we're too lenient on convicted sex offenders. Wavelength. Before the break, Arj spoke with the leader of the opposition here um, in SA, Peter Malinowskis. But next, I speak with Sonia Ryan from the Carly Ryan Foundation about the Hamas Barami case. The Carly Ryan Foundation is an advocacy group that focuses on that focuses on harm prevention and online safety, established in the wake of the horrific murder of Carly Ryan. Again, this next part of the story discusses sexual assault and sexual violence, so if any of that causes any problems for you, please just turn the radio down now. Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. I'm joined by Sonia Ryan, head of the Carly Ryan Foundation, and I'd like to start off by saying thank you. Many years ago, you actually came to speak at Emmanuel College. At the time, I had a friend who was speaking to someone who was about 30-plus years old, so I think it's safe to say that you had a major impact saving her life. It's an amazing um, experience to share with me. Thank you. I've asked to speak to you today, Sonia, due to the Hamas Barami case where a 33-year-old man was given a maximum sentence of four years with a minimum of three, and he could be in and out in as little as two years with time served 
after he sexually abused a 10-year-old girl in a Blair Athol toilet block. What was your reaction to the sentence? I think the sentence, sentence was absolutely appalling. You know, at the end of the day, we're dealing with crimes against innocent children here. And um, when an offender chooses to uh, sexually abuse a young person, that's going to affect that young person's life moving forward if they survive that criminal attack. So for me, uh, sentences should be a maximum and they should be applied by the courts. I think we are seeing an, an absolute inadequacy of sentencing, not only here in South Australia, but also nationally when it comes to crimes against children. We are seeing people getting longer sentences for armed robbery, other offences, and yet when it comes to our children being offended against, and we're talking not just, you know, young people, we're talking infants, toddlers being sexually abused. And so for some time I have been pushing the federal government to look at sentencing reforms and have put a few practical um, ideas forward for that. What are some of those ideas and recommendations you've made to the government? One of the recommendations was potentially, say, half a dozen federal circuit court judges overseeing sentencing for serious crimes against children. So they would essentially come into the state court and hand over an adequate sentence. I think that that would potentially change the yardstick and change sentencing overall. I mean, sentences do not reflect community expectation. When it comes to people offending against them, I think the full force of the law should be handed down upon those people. Remember, they're choosing to take advantage of a young person's innocence and that kind of cunning offending is, I think, one of the worst types of offendings. In the Barami case, he was given a 40% sentence reduction mm -hmm. because he pleaded guilty so early. So before the first four weeks, you can receive up to a 40% reduction. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that particular clause in the Sentencing Act? I don't agree with it. You know, I believe that essentially if you offend against a child, you should be given a maximum sentence. That maximum sentence should be applied by the courts and a person should serve out that time because it's not only the physical abuse that a young person has to deal with. It's a mental anguish, the emotional damage. Stop and pause and think for a moment what that would be like as a victim of crime, to try and find a way forward in their life, to have normal functioning relationships, to be able to get employment, to be able to be a, a normal functioning person in society is extremely hard. Now, that kind of damage really needs to be viewed by the court um, in, a, in a very serious manner. Part of our criminal justice system is to both punish and rehabilitate. Do you believe that these types of offenders can be rehabilitated? I don't believe that. In fact, latest research out of the US from Dr Michael Burke says generally a person who offends against a child has been subjected to some form of violence in their youth. And I don't truly understand what motivates somebody to be sexually aroused by a child or an infant or a toddler, but ultimately they are and they're opportunistic. So even if they try and get some support and help, often they will fall back into offending if an opportunity arises. And that's what we have seen over and over. Is there anything else that you'd like to add on what more needs to be done to protect our children? I think, you know, for parents listening, be sure you know what applications your children are using online. Um, remember, you're providing the mobile device and, the, and access to the internet. Understand the apps that are on your child's phone. See if they enable private chat functionality and do not underestimate the ability of some of these online offenders, especially with the increase of kids being online at the moment. So make sure you have that discussion with your kids. If something doesn't feel right, if something just doesn't seem OK, come and talk to me about what's happened and we'll work through it together. And if I don't know what to do, we'll go to the Carly Ryan Foundation or we'll go to the Office of the eSafety Commissioner's website. I think that's a excellent place to leave that with. You should definitely head to the Carly Ryan Foundation website to find out any useful and practical tips in educating your child and keeping them safe. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. That there was Arch chatting with... Sonia Ryan from the Carly, Ryan, Carly Ryan, I should say, Foundation. I think essentially what this chat has shown me, Arsh, personally, is that our sentencing laws for convicted, for convicted sex offenders is woefully inadequate. It's unbelievably inadequate. <laughs> it, um, it really doesn't prevent crimes from happening again and reoffending from happening again. And I have seen the first-hand effects. I've known so many people close to me who are survivors of sexual violence, and it completely alters how they interact in the world for life. Mm. And I think our sentencing laws need to be much harsher 
in both punishing these offenders and mm-hmm. protecting our future children and future victims. Absolutely. And you were telling me in the break um, that you've got some first-hand experience, a bit of a relationship with the Carly Ryan Foundation. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. So one of my friends, um, when we were going in high school, uh, picked up an online stalker who was aged roughly around 30 years old. And we didn't really know how to deal with that situation. And ironically, soon after it came to light, Sonia Ryan actually came and spoke um, to us as a, as a school cohort mm-hmm. um, and each year individually. And it complete like that, the education she provided directly saved her life, I think. That's amazing. So, th- I mean, the Carly Ryan Foundation, they're an absolutely incredible organisation based here in South Australia, yeah? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. are. Um, and they, they do work internationally as well. Um, the other thing I'd just like to, to, to add is that our sentencing laws are designed and it's actually written out that the primary purpose of sentencing is to protect the community and that secondary purposes such as rehabilitation and that sort of thing is a secondary purpose. Yep. And so if that is the case, then our sentencing laws need to be much harsher. The right. Catholic Church back uh, when, before the, the scandals came to light in uh, Spotlight and various other news organisations, they actually had rehabilitation programs for their priests who were offending. Right. And that showed zero ability to stop offending from happening again. Well, it's definitely a very tricky situation, but hopefully um, our politicians like Peter Malinowskis and changes can be made in the future so that um, our penalties can be potentially harsher or that something can be done about this problem. Thank you so much for your really tireless work on this story. I know you worked super hard on it. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to do both the story and the survivor's justice in Absolutely. this particular case, yeah. You definitely did. Again, if uh, this story tonight has raised any trauma or problems for you, please know there's help out there. 1-800-RESPECT, they provide confidential sexual assault and family, domestic violence, counselling via phone and web chat, available 24 hours a day. Anyway, next, Wavelength explains everything you need to know about what's happened with the coronavirus this week. Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. There is currently 23.3 million cases of COVID-19 worldwide. France is seeing a concerning surge in numbers again after almost 4,900 cases have been confirmed in the past 24 hours. Compared to the initial outbreak, which saw COVID spread amongst the elderly, the virus is now circulating four times higher amongst people under 40 in a small European country. Closer to home, South Korea has returned to putting social distancing measures in place again after cases began to rise from Seoul. Australia has just under 25,000 confirmed cases. Victoria is starting to see promise of flattening the curve, recording 115 new cases today and 15 deaths. New South Wales recorded three new cases, all of which have been in self-isolation. Queensland is still trying to contain a cluster after a 77-year-old supervisor at Brisbane Youth Detention Centre tested positive for the virus. Two infectious people linked to the outbreak visited 40 locations. As a result, the state government is capping gatherings in the southeast without a COVID-safe plan to 10 and limiting other areas to 30. SA is keeping their borders closed to New South Wales and Victorians are no longer allowed to cross over unless they qualify as an essential traveller. There is no indication of when border restrictions may be eased. Numbers have continued to remain low with two cases this past week from interstate travellers who have been in quarantine upon arrival. Wavelength, sparking the combos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. That there was a Miller letting you know everything you needed to know about the coronavirus. Wavelength. It's time for the last part of the show and one of my favourites, heaps good news. It's where we uncover all the good stuff going on in Adelaide, Australia and the world to remind you that everything isn't going to hell completely. Not just yet. <laughs> this week, Ant has the stories for us. I know there's gonna be... Heaps good news on Wavelength. It's been another big news week again with plenty of stories making it appear that the world is continuing to fall apart. Yet if you look a little deeper, there is still plenty of reasons to keep a smile on your face. Wavelength this week gives you a few snippets of positive news which occurred from around the world. Starting first in the New South Wales Hunter Valley, 20 individuals from the critically endangered bird species named the Regent Honey Eater were released as part of a captive breeding program. 
One of the birds, which could not be located for a period of three weeks, was later found at a location which had not seen a Regent honey eater for the last 20 years, along with six individuals which had never been spotted before. Considering the entire population is around about 300, six new birds is pretty significant. In other news, the Made in Australia label is something we have seen less and less of over time. But there has now been a finding that with the unemployment rate predicted to reach 10% in Australia, many more people are becoming more conscious of the origin of their products. Since April, the Australian made label has seen an increase of 30% for the amount of time people spend on their website. This has led to them teaming up with eBay to make it even easier to purchase locally produced products. Additionally, as consumers are beginning to purchase Australian made products, there is evidence to suggest that businesses are also beginning to reevaluate their supply chains. This is a positive sign that we may be moving towards a future where production favours local employment rather than purely cost savings. Moving overseas now, an organisation called Fundayek has developed a series of online workshops to assist the people of Colombia to learn about the different aspects of agriculture, including seed selection, soil health, pest and disease management and harvest. The country has been heavily impacted by the coronavirus, with more than 10 million people becoming unemployed and local food production becoming a topic of great importance. The courses have led to many families producing food in their own gardens to share with their community, rather than relying on importation from elsewhere. A specific example came from central Colombia, in which 13 families worked together on a small farm which produced a first harvest that could be shared with over 70 people. Fundayek has noticed that materialism has caused the agricultural industry to become incapable of bringing prosperity to all people involved, so I've explored an approach which looks at the harmony between science and religion. In this sense, agricultural practices, backed by years of scientific research, are incorporated with principles of fairness and cooperation, and are carried out with humility and appreciation towards the land and the environment. So there we have it. As much as we like to think 2020 is a write-off, there's been many glimpses of hope that may not have occurred or would have passed by greatly unnoticed had the world not been forced to work together to overcome these unprecedented circumstances. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. Thank you all for listening. That brings us to the end of the show, sadly. Thank you so much for coming in, Arsh. Yeah, no worries. It was a pleasure to come in. Uh, make sure you're subscribed to the Wavelength podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can listen back to our old episodes right now, and you'll be the first to know when tonight's episode goes up.